Welcome to the Metta Hour with Sharon Salzberg, where Buddhist wisdom meets everyday life. This podcast is brought to you by the Be Here Now Network and features interviews with the top leaders, teachers, and thinkers of the mindfulness movement and beyond. For more information, visit BeHereNowNetwork.com backslash Sharon. Okay, so I want to say a little bit about the self and uh, some about balance as we continue on. I also thought of something this morning, um, listening uh, about another way of, of sort of holding, different ways we hold the sense of who we are or sense of self. So by popular demand, I'm bringing back this story about this time when uh, I was riding in a car with a friend and we got stuck in this terrible, hideous traffic and were complaining very bitterly about it all the while. And then my friend said, you know, we're the traffic too, you know. (laughs) And I thought, oh, that's very interesting, you know, like... And I realized that that's the place of privilege, right? Like, these these are my roads, and you're in my way. You know, they belong to me, and so the rightful driver to set the pace is me, or us, you know, and then you're, you're a big hazard, you know, move it. But what if that sort of um, centrality, that sense of centrality drops away, and it's we, We're all in this road. We're all the traffic. We're all trying to cope. Maybe we need to seek a common solution to the traffic flow in this town or something, right? Um, And that's just an interesting moment when when the bottom drops out and that sense of being central while everyone else is marginalized drops away. And it becomes we rather than such a a rigid or calcified sense of self and other and us and them. And of course, as we said, individual existence is here, right? It's not like we become a soup, you know? And um, it's not that you lose all boundaries, but there is also a we reality that is a little bit like looking at that tree and seeing the network of which it is really made to see that we are part of this whole rather than only, you know, choosing a college or whatever it is on our own. Um, And so uh, that's an interesting reflection and the kinds of consequences of not just having that sense of centrality but being attached to it. You know, they're very strong. It's like I often... Um, talk about, you know, when that whole uh, terror, I just had a really good time in France, this is really not a knock on France what I'm about to say, but when that whole uh, series of events terrible events happens in Japan ending up with Fukushima and the nuclear incident, so I was was, uh, home in Massachusetts reading a whole bunch of foreign newspapers online at the time and I remember reading this French headline which said something like, um, radioactive material is flowing across the Pacific due to fortuitous winds. And I thought, well, maybe they're fortuitous if you live in France, but it's not that nice if you live in Seattle, is it? You know. And besides, don't we still believe the Earth is round and like stuff can go around the other side? But we kind of don't in a way, right? We all have a different sense of where the wall is or the boundary, what's going to keep it over there rather than than come here? But what is the reality? The earth is round and things kind of do keep coming around. Or uh, I think it was even the same time sort of, same time period. It was not um, Hurricane Sandy. It was the one before, I think, Hurricane Irene. Uh, I was also in Massachusetts and reading a lot of New York City newspapers then. And uh, so first I was reading the alarm, like, it's coming, it's going to be immense, it's uh, catastrophic, you know. And then um, I guess when it hit, it didn't really affect New York City all that much. 
So then I was reading uh, all this stuff about, oh, it was all media hype, as though they were not the media, right, themselves, um, that had hyped it. But it's all media hype, didn't really do anything. And then I thought, well, not if you're in Vermont, which is drowning, you know? But we just have these senses of this is the tribe, or these are, this is we, this is mine, that's it's over there. Uh, and the greatest difficulty with that mindset is that it doesn't reflect reality, which I, I used the other night as Bob's favorite word, you know, reality, what's realistic. Um, because once we are at sort of a funny, distorted angle to the truth, we're always going to struggle. How could we not, right? Because we're not aligned with the truth of, of how things are. It's like the proverbial banging your head against the wall. So it's really, there are many ways in which we look at self and other and us and them, uh, almost like keeping the integrity of that, but loosening the grip of the kind of over-identification with that. And so uh, here we are, you know, taking a look. And, from the meditative point of view, um, that investigation, that exploration, is uh, most easily done from a state of a certain kind of balance. You know, because if we get sort of overwrought every time we see something come up in our minds and judgmental, and especially if we cling to it, like, I'm such an angry person, and I always will be, um, or we go into a spiral of tremendous aversion. I can't believe I'm thinking this. No one else is thinking at all. They're sitting in bliss. I'm thinking, I'm so terrible. I'm so bad. We don't have the right relationship to look more deeply into what our experience is. The way mindfulness leads to insight or understanding, um, which is one of our words, understanding, is through having a kind of balance. Now, I never really liked the word balance. I always felt it could imply mediocrity or something really cold or aloof or uncaring or, uh, you know, sort of boring. And, uh, but really, it's a very dynamic state. It's not meant to imply something inert. It's a state that has some spaciousness to it, a tremendous amount of willingness to look, right? So there's a kind of energy. Um, a sort of audacity <laughs> to think differently or look differently, not just to be bound to, to habits of old. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot happening in that, in that balance. What's not happening is like a fixed need or a sense of expectation. I've got to see this and only this. Or We all know what it's like, even as an example, um, to be at work and to go into a meeting and somebody there has this really rigid, fixed idea of a resolution to some problem or dilemma. And maybe 50, I have to look at you, you're having the best time. Uh, maybe 50 other solutions are being proposed and they're just not even hearing it. It's like, and maybe some of them are even maybe better, but they're not hearing it because it's got to be just the one thing, right? And how much do we walk around like that? Or do we have a kind of motivation that is contouring how we're looking? Um, I feel like I've been in many meetings now with scientists, researchers, and neuroscientists presenting their findings on uh, meditation practice in the brain, and um, there's a process that I, I've found intriguing where uh, the presenting scientist will do the presentation, and then they'll kind of take a breath, and then everyone else in the room will like jump on them, like, well, maybe, you know, maybe that wasn't caused by that, maybe that was caused by that, maybe, how do you know that, or maybe Matthew Ricard was wiggling his eyebrows, they said once. And that was producing the change in the brainwave and not a change in the brainwave from meditation. How do you know? Um, and it's been so interesting. And I said to one of my friends, I said, in a way, you really have to trust the motive of everyone in the room that people are seeking the truth. They're, they're being that honest and that probing because everyone wants to know the truth of how things are. That's what science is. And 
And I said, but you really have to think, not be thinking, I wonder if they want my grants, you know, <laughs> my grant money, and that's why they're doing this. And then that question's coming from that weird place, you know. Uh, but sometimes we're coming from a weird place. And we can, we can look at our own motivation and, and check that. You know, where are we coming from? What do we really want to see? In a conversation, in an encounter, do we want to be seen as right or do we want a resolution? Do we want to bring up everybody as much as we can? Do we want to crush somebody because it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world? You know, like, where are we coming from? Um, there's a big difference, and we can feel it when we pay attention between a more narrow, confined uh, tunnel vision sort of holding. It's got to be just this one way. And an interest and an openness it doesn't mean you have no convictions or no values or no principles or no ideas of your own, uh, but there can also be openness, right? Which is, is more reflective of life as it needs to be. Because when was the last time we were really successful while we were holding on to a fixed idea that was defying anything like change? You know, it, it's not really a success strategy um, to defy change and try to pretend it doesn't happen. So we have that option of looking at balance and really saying, well, what is it? And what I've come to see is, is that it's not as I had feared, you know, this really boring, kind of dull, um, repressed state of not being able to feel anything, but it is a, a really different way of being with what's going on so that um, the maybe more normal, habitual limitations, and they are limitations, that give us tunnel vision or give us, um, you know, keep us bound to habitual reactions. They don't have to be so operative, even if, even if they're coming up. You know, we can kind of see them for, for what they are. So this is really our, our opportunity. You know, it's like when that friend of mine said, well, we're the traffic too. It's like all of a sudden perspective shifted. You know, and it's like, oh yeah, look, there's another whole way of looking. Um, or what happens when uh, we take that moment as we did earlier today to reflect on how many people contributed to the fact that we're sitting here right now. Or we take the effort, we make the effort to look at the tree and think about everything feeding it, you know, which is a sense. It's, not, it's like a, um, a mood almost, you know. It's not like you're going to do a soil analysis, you know, and try to... Uh, pinpoint exactly what, because it's a lot, but uh, it's that knowing that we live in connection and truth to one another, that's how things are, um, that it is an interdependent universe, and that the, the heart's response to that, which is what we discover, the heart's response to that is to, is the generation of qualities like love and compassion. Uh, which are a great relief, <laughs> to go back to that, and have to have understanding in them. Um, one of the things people often say about a word like love is that it's so saccharine, it's so over-sentimentalized. Uh, one person once told me they completely detested loving-kindness meditation because as they put it, it reminds me of a continually enforced Valentine's Day. Like on the count of three, you'll be filled with love. Um, and so it's, it's really not like that at all. I also go back to this kind of pithy statement from the Buddha uh, when he said, I teach one thing and one thing only that is suffering and the end of suffering. I teach one thing and one thing only that is suffering and the end of suffering. Um, there's one kind of witty friend of mine said once, uh, suffering and the end of suffering are two things, not just one I thought thing. you said that. No, 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 someone else said that. <laughs> but Mark quoted me, and uh, we once did a whole workshop, which you can catch at Tibet House US. I, I thought you said that. No, 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 no. It wasn't me, <clears throat> but I'll take two it. Two things, Sharon so. It's two things. <laughs> um, well, not one thing, but sometimes it is one but thing. It is what is one that thing. about? Yeah. We did a whole workshop on that, so check it out, Tibet House US. 
Um, and the, you know, because that's the, um, we could say that's the grid, that's the, uh, that's the valence that we're looking at. It's not good and bad, and you're like, you know, uh, a good person or not a good person. It's, it's not like that. It's about suffering and the end of suffering. And that also links to the fact that our own suffering um, leads us to cause suffering. You know, that, that therefore our own happiness, freedom, joy, release is not a selfish thing. It's not like just being self-satisfied, you know, going home and lying on the couch and think I'm really good, you know. It's not like that. But our every interaction, our every effort, our every um, moment, really, is an expression of that question. Do we have a sense of inner resource and worth or not? And not, if not, there are consequences to that. I, th I, think, I think if you translate it instead of an, if you're suffering along with its end, I think there's a way of suffering along with its end. Then it seems I more teach like one, one thing, thing and one thing only. Suffering, suffering along, along with, with its, its end. end. Oh, we just solved a very age-old dilemma. Okay. <laughs> Making the end a big thing. Then, then they get that suffering along with, with its, its end. end. Okay. okay. That's good. <laughs> so. <laughs> Just think about that for a moment. You know, right. Doesn't that feel better? <laughs> the more of the end, those always feels better. Um, I forgot where I was going to say that. Oh, uh, so that implies, you know, the we we're talking also this morning about traumas and um, things that come up when you say to a retreat. <laughs> I can't wait till the marketing department at IMS sees that. <laughs> it's horrible encounters. <laughs> Stuff. Um, you know, uh, the possibility does exist right there to relate differently, at, which is the whole point. When I said this morning, what then? You know, we admit the sometimes really grievous truth of what happened, and then what? You know, do we go on in a different way? Do we not? Do we hold what happened or happens in isolation? Or do we forge a sense of community from it? Do we have compassion for ourselves and ultimately for others from it or not? You know, that's the, that's the moment of our possibility in our practice. But it's also not a mandate. And this is something that I think is really important in this day and age, not a mandate in the sense that uh, we can easily fall back into good and bad and right and wrong depending on that relationship. But really it's not, it's not that way. Um, it's like it reminds me of my most recent book. It was called uh, Real Love. And I was quite late in turning in that book, really late, uh, like two years late. Um, <laughs> But I was one day early from my final, final deadline was August 1st, a few years ago, and I turned it in July 31st. So happy. And uh, I turned it in, and I got an away message from the publisher. Um, and I thought, oh, great. You know, I could have had three more weeks. <laughs> but it didn't happen that way. So I waited and waited and waited and waited for something, you know, to come back about the book. And... He finally wrote to me and he said, I really like the book. You know, the part I liked the most was when you quoted Joan Halifax, Roshi Joan Halifax, when she said something like, don't try to force yourself to think of the traumas of your life as a gift. Think of them as givens. And don't, don't <laughs> try to... Think of them as a given. Think of them as a given, not as a gift. Don't try to force yourself to think of them as a gift think of them as a given, like this happened. You know, because if you try to force yourself to think of them as a gift, then you're not liking the way you really feel, you know, and you're, you're, you're kind of pushing in a false way or phony way, and it's like pressure to, you know, have it appear like that you're grateful. Maybe you're not that grateful today, you know? 
uh, but it's a given. So what are you going to do with it? You know. So rather than assume this persona of this kind of perfect, very sweet relationship, recognize, okay, this happened. Now what's possible, right? So my first reaction upon reading it was, I also really, really appreciated the quote. And then I thought, oh, his favorite part of my new book, I didn't even write. <laughs> Someone else wrote that. <laughs> it was kind of my favorite part of the book, too. <laughs> so, you know, so that's the other side of it. It's like there's a, a tremendous possibility and an invitation, and it's not like a measure of your worth, you know, as to how you meet it. Or it's not like a demand or an expectation, which means it's really up to us. And... Um, honoring that sense of possibility, you know, as, as much as we can. Okay, so, do you want to say something about anxiety and depression before we go on? Because somebody asked me. Um, I want to say something about uh, facing the ego. Okay. Um, in, in, about uh, what I learned from Bob, so maybe I can get you to talk about uh, um, the feeling of injured innocence. Of injury? Of injured, injured innocence. innocence. In, injured injured innocence. innocence. Oh, injured innocence. Injured oh, good. Innocence. Oh, yeah. Because the main thing I've, well, the, not the main, one very important thing I've learned from doing this stuff with these guys is to understand the Buddhist notion of emptiness or egolessness or selflessness. You first have to find the self as it actually appears to you in your own real experience. So you can't just leapfrog over who you think you are in order to find the greater, the, the greater reality, whatever that might be. And so there are certain ways entrenched in the Buddhist psychology of zeroing in on the self that the Buddha asserted doesn't exist. Uh, because in order to understand what he meant by the self that doesn't exist, you have to find the self that you think does exist. And uh, that's not as easy as it sounds. But there's a couple of tricks. One, one that I learned long ago from Bob that I think he could describe maybe uh, in, a, you know, in one particular way, if he will. Will you? What's that? Would you talk, <laughs> I'm sorry? Will you, will, will you talk will, about injured you innocence? Oh, injured innocence. Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, I guess you want me to do that? Yeah. Oh, well, then we should do that with the, in, in the context of meditating, OK? So go into meditative mode then, the easiest way to do that. And uh, this is uh, something known as the four keys of meditating on selflessness, which of course is a really key and important meditation for all types of, I'm sorry, I was looking for a battery for my hearing aid, never mind. Oh. Do you need, all kinds of meditation. Do you need it in your bag? I, know one, I have batteries, but never mind, don't worry. So, so uh, it's a weird battery for a weird type of hearing aid, don't worry. So, so go into meditative mode, and in meditative mode, they said this thing called the four keys of meditation on emptiness. The four and, keys? Um, keys yeah, selflessness, keys? Emptiness, keys. same thing. Keys. keys. Same thing. Keys, keys, keys. Right? So the first key, the first key is called the identification of what is negated by the word selflessness. The lessness makes it a negation. And so what is it, in order to understand a negation, like this room is a lacking of an elephant, <laughs> so you have to know what an elephant is, right? So in order to understand selflessness, and that's what wisdom is, is the understanding of selflessness, you have to know what self is being negated. And so the first key is to identify that which is being negated, okay? So, in your meditation, you try to remember a time when you were innocent of something and someone accused you of it, preferably very vehemently, and even best is when someone you care about. Uh, you know, said, you did, how could you do such and such? How could you do that? How, why did you do that? You did such and such, and you didn't do it. It doesn't work if you did. 
<laughs> but if you didn't, then you strongly feel uh, the condition of injured innocence. And in remembering this incident, sort of a little bit like an actor, method actor, you know, you want to inhabit the emotion and the gut feeling that you felt. And this is a feeling that, that explodes or magnifies itself very quickly, probably, in whatever you can manage to remember, into a feeling of indignation, righteous indignation, and eventually maybe anger if the person keeps doesn't listen to your alibi or your protestations of innocence and keeps accusing unjustly. So uh, this is not to muddy it with those reactions. The very first shot of injured innocence is what you try to remember. And in the process of remembering, you do something that surprises you when you think you're supposed to be supposed to be thinking about a sort of space and an absence and all this kind of thing that people think about in the negation, you know, like emptiness or selflessness. On the contrary, your memory awareness, you try to make that a smallest part of your concentration or your consciousness. So that is, it's as if you were a spy or a hidden witness. And the main feature of your consciousness is to recover the feeling of injured innocence in your gut, you know, which you might articulate verbally as like, how could they think I would do that? How could that, that I would never do that, you know, like, I'm, I don't do that sort of thing, you know, all that sort of thing would arise from this feeling. And so try to remember such an incident and try to feel the frustration and the, and the indignation, and the, but not the reaction, just the feeling of hurt and where it hurts that they would think and that they would wrongly accuse you, he, she, or they. As I hope you can see, as you bear down on inhabiting such a moment in your past, remembering in the form of reliving, it's like a kind of sickly feeling in the pit of your stomach sort of rising toward a kind of tightness in the diaphragm, in the chest, uh, up at the base of your rib cage, And it's like the sense of I, of ego, as a pronoun, seems to come from unquestioningly. I would never, I am not like that, I. I, not me, no, I'm not like that, no, I, of course, those are all reactions that come from this feeling of fixed root, rootedness, 
in this sort of gut heart area. They say that to achieve the wisdom, the intuitive understanding of selflessness, you should pursue this rooted I-ness until you sort of admit to yourself that you don't agree with the Buddha or anybody who says selfless. <laughs> and you then recognize from someone who does say that kind of thing, since if you think about it, they are experienced teachers, that they are fully aware that such a teaching is a challenge, and they don't expect a simplistic agreement from you. Since you feel and you felt in those situations, unquestionably, undeniably, I am innocent. I, really I, am not like that. I wouldn't, I not only did, I wouldn't do such a thing. It's not in my identity. Then, maybe unusually, you really kind of get it right away. Or many of you have practiced it in the past, and maybe this a little bit, you, you know what, what you can feel, what what is being referred to here. And then you can move to the second key. And the second key is, well, I don't feel I'm selfless, if that's what is meant. Because I am like this and not like that. I definitely feel. Real, I feel I really am like this. I'm, I'm a good person, not like that kind of person. But maybe Buddha, Nagarjuna, such and such teachers, maybe they knew something that I don't. So I will engage in the inquiry. I will accept a challenge. And I will see if I, where they went wrong in my case, <laughs> or where I'm going wrong. And I make a commitment ahead of time that I'm going to abide by the outcome. I'm not going to wander off into a state of indeterminate wonderment. Well, I still feel this way, but I'm not sure, but this way, that way. In other words, I will be pragmatic in my conclusion, which is surprising also. but. The, the, that only has to do with the nature of 
having an understanding that is negate, negational. You know, if you're looking for an elephant in the room here, because someone says there's no elephant and you want to verify that, you sort of just give up looking at a certain point. You never find the non-elephant. So a negational cognition is sort of open-ended. You know what you expect to find, you know the conditions under which you would find it, they are not satisfied, and then you sort of bag the process of looking at a certain point, you're satisfied. But you never close around a non-elephant. So it's a different, different thing from a positive cognition. That you know that in your experience. So when you're going to be checking this gut feeling of self with an open-ended inquiry, if you don't find it within certain parameters, you will abide by that acceptance. You will accept that conclusion, which will be counter to your gut feeling. You recognize ahead of time. And then that creates a certain situation. So you, you, you make a commitment about that. You set up the experiment, experimental parameters for your inner work, inner inquiry. And then you start to take a look inside yourself. And the first thing you do is you look through your material processes. You do what Johnny Cabot then calls a body scan. And you look, you look in your gut. You sort of look in your brain, you look in your nervous system, you look in your heartbeat and your digestive system, whatever map you have of your body, you look in it. And there is there some sort of a solid thing in there that makes you feel ill when it's disrespected, that you feel that the I arises from, and that the I refers to and clunk hits it. So you look for that. And here we have a wonderful gift of the wonderful scientific materialists of the last few centuries who have gone right into the body and the cells and the molecules and the atoms and then in the last century especially the subatomic particles and the waves and then the inconceivable super subtle realm on the boundary of the speed of light and below the wave particle paradox and where there's spooky action at a distance, all this kind of, we can meditatively go in there. You don't have to know the math, because it's a matter of like little billiard balls and images, you know, and little explosions. And you can go into that. And If you develop meditative concentration along with your inquiry, which is what vipassana is supposed to do, your vipassana, you'll have a feeling that whatever this self is, it's not a material, at least an ordinary material thing. You definitely will achieve that. So then you say, well, maybe it's a sensation because I feel all congested when someone accused me and I, I feel like, oh, like, ah, no, you know, I feel sickly that, I'm, that it's being stressed like that. 
So it's a feeling, kind of. So then you look at those feelings, those sensations. And that's a, it's kind of painful, but, but then you notice that they are change. It's not a set feeling, it's not a same feeling always. Now it feels like congestion, now it feels like a heat, like a kind of rage, now it feels icy cold, now it feels, you know, you. There's no fixed feeling that has you, your own name on it as a label, could hold your name as a label, or even could hold the syllable I, or the Greek two-syllable ego. So then you think, well, wait a minute, maybe it is my name. It's maybe an image I have of myself a word or an image or a sound. So then you look into your verbal, imaginative, ideational processes. And I have a word self, and I have a word Bob, and I have a word human, and I have a word I. And I know the pronoun, pers personal pronoun in many languages. Wo, otakushi. Na, aham, moi, ich. You can go through all of them. And even those things you will disassemble under your investigative vipassana ish analysis as you turn your mind in. And you, like, for example, my name is Bob, but some people call me Hey You, some people call me Dodo Head, some people call me Thurman, some people call me Bo, some people call me Alexander, I mean, et cetera, you know, you, you, even Bob is a construct. So then maybe it's the emotion but then you move to sort of the emotions and the deeper structural mental functions. And you say, well, maybe, maybe it's kind of a surge of self-assertion or a surge of presence. Maybe it's my feeling of a fixed presence because I'm here, you know. So you look at that not articulated, not, not sensational, not physical, but kind of. Mm. And then you realize that all of those deeper sense of presence, emotional surges, they're all changeable. None of them have the name Bob on them. They're not fixed identities. So then you come to consciousness process. And of course, that's probably where it is, right? It's that point that Mark's dad, you know, the, the controlling, unchanging point of subjectivity. It somehow always registers all the different changing things. So, you realize that your visual, your consciousness is often tied up with what you're seeing, with what you're hearing, with what you're smelling, what you're tasting, what you're touching. So none of those are fixed to you. They're just reacting to the stimuli on the different sensory levels. And then there's a mental consciousness that can imagine things and can align with the visual one, can align with the hearing one, can align with the smelling, tasting, touching one. But then it's, when it aligns with them, it's always changing. But still, it seems as if at the root of all of it is an unchanging, observing self, the wit pure witness. And so then you turn, try to turn back on that subjectivity. And each time you do, you notice that you don't find it. You don't, you don't land on it. But then you say, of course I don't, because I'm the one who's looking. 
So it's like a dog's tail when it's turning around to catch its tail. Tail whips out of its out of its field. So then you decide, well, I'm a yogi, and I'm not going to give up that easy. I'm going to concentrate. And then if you really have that concentration, you will start spinning in your mind. You'll become a whirling dervish trying to catch your subjectivity as an object, that you can confirm its presence. And as you whirl and whirl at the deepest inner layer of your being, they say you become like a diamond drill. And the diamond drill seems to be seeking the diamond drillable which is that first sense of solid self that you have found during the first key identifying the self. And so you're trying to drill down to where you hit bedrock with, with the bedrock. And when you do, and when you drill, and you drill, and then this is where you really need shamatha, stability of meditative awareness. You really need one-pointedness, chittasya ekagrata, one-pointedness of mind, samadhi, <coughs> to companion with your probing, inquiring, vipassana, seeing analytical mind. And when you can with, withstand that, what will happen, they say, is it will become kind of unbearable. The sort of all stress and all focus and all concentration turned on itself, but never quite finding itself. And then this will kind of reach critical mass and you will go into what is called, you will go into balance. What Sharon was talking about. And it's called a space-like equipoised concentration. And it will have relief, actually. And you will feel relieved and a, fi a feeling of expansion. You'll lose a sense of the subjectivity that's looking. You'll lose a sense of the objectivity that's being looked for. And you will sort of space out. And it will be so powerful that your body will, you'll have a sense of your body disappearing, your thinking process disappearing, your sensational process disappearing, except for a kind of sense of release and relief. And then it's very critical that, although words will also disappear at that point, but it's very critical that you don't leave intact one sort of feeling of unchanging presence that this space is the self. Even though, of course, it wasn't contained inside your gut, but yet it feels like so real and it's such a relief. There is a huge temptation to feel that this vast sense of vastness and expansion and space is that self that you are looking for. But if you have the momentum of vipassana, without words, that critical seeing, which is what the word vipassana means, will immediately evaluate itself in the space, or uh, maybe you'll enjoy the relief for a while first, <laughs> but eventually we'll evaluate the experience of the spacious balance, and it will kind of go through it, and it will get out of its own way, and it will not be experienced as a place apart from where you were before. Although, when you move from the space-like equipoise, samadhi, 
when you return to being sitting here in the chair in Tibet house or wherever you are meditating, wherever you are pursuing that inquiry, the feeling of that spacious thing will balance itself within the field of differentiation and you will enter what they call the dream-like or the illusion-like aftermath samadhi so that suddenly things will be experienced in their differences and yourself will be experienced in its difference in a sort of lighter way just as when you see your face in the mirror you see your face but you know it's not your face at the same time as you see it without having to have a second thought about it because you know underlyingly that it's a reflection in a mirror so it's both your face and not your face and that doesn't frighten you or freak you out. In fact, it carries over the relief into what you previously thought of as the unrelieved experience of self versus everything other. So then you can relax even they accuse you. <laughs> Is that helpful, Mark? Is that, that was, helpful? That was great. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, could, <laughs> could you uh, wait for the microphone? Microphone. Um. I'm from Ireland, so I hope you can understand me with my accent. Um, uh, my question is, what are your thoughts on spiritual escapism, whereby um, one goes from the practice of maybe mindfulness, seated meditation, yoga, whatever it might be, and you find yourself looking forward to the next practice so that you can experience that bliss or peace, um, spaciousness, and so on. And um, outside of it, it's, it's not so blissful or spacious or nice. <laughs> um, it's just the term that has come up for me recently quite a bit. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. I think we all could answer differently, maybe, or maybe the same. I would say there's a lot to be said for it. Uh, for the for the um, the positive experiences that you're having that one is having in those you, you know we're 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 locked into a sense of unease uh, because of our confusion that's the so we have to be realistic about oh yeah this sort of seems like a drag our regular lives and then we go to these places where uh, the um, the parrying you know with reality that I, I don't know if you were here last night but where the assault, the trauma of everyday life is removed from us a little bit and we can feel the, our natural state start to emerge, that's very uh, reassuring that you, know, you can develop a lot of um, inner strength from that that eventually helps you be in the regular world that's more difficult mm -hmm. with this kind of courage or confidence or faith or... Um, uh, you know, you know what I'm saying. Wisdom, yeah. uh, wisdom, maybe even. Uh, so I wouldn't worry yet about uh, um, uh, a sense of attachment to the escapist aspect of the spiritual. You know, obviously, if you like, if you watched the uh, uh, Wild Wild Country, if you watched the the documentary on Rajneesh that was on Netflix, you could see how bad it could be. Yes. You can see where it can go. That yes. sense of escapism. Uh, but, um, you know, it doesn't have to go that bad. Okay. I consider this kind of thing an advance. <laughs> so you're getting an advance on then dealing with the nitty-gritty sort of thing, you know, right? This is an advance. And then the French expression also, I like, reculer pour mieux sauter. You know what that means? 
that means you draw back to be able to jump further. So, you know, you, well, wait, you're going in the wrong direction. You're going away from that high jump. Well, you go far away, so then you can jump further the next time. And baby step, baby step, you know. That's it, bit by bit. It gets better and better, right? Baby Doesn't steps. It? Baby Doesn't steps. It? it does. It does. I would also agree with that. I mean, I think <laughs> that, uh, you know, there's, there's also a way. I mean, I think the gap that we're looking for, I'm certainly looking for, um, is, is first, the first gap is between what we're feeling and how we're acting. That's a really important place for some spaciousness. You know, and so the consequences of really clinging to the retreat space are different than preferring it or taking the point that there might be something within it that you really need to work on transferring into your ordinary day-to-day life. Um, they're just different. It's like when I was using the example of wanting to get the new apartment so I could have the ownership of, of the wall hanging. You know, we want something so badly we don't look at the consequences of what else we're giving up or what we're compromising in order to get it. And so that's just like tunnel vision. You know, that's attachment. And so, uh, but there's a, a, a tremendous gift, if your life allows for that, you know, to, to be able to enjoy it. It's also very culturally ridden, you know, like for people who say come to a three-month retreat at the center I co-founded. Uh, many of them have friends or family members who are completely mystified. Like, completely. Like, how in the world could you contemplate, say, being silent or, or going on intensive retreat for three whole months? And if you told one of them that you were going to graduate school for four years, I bet they wouldn't blink. You know, right? You know, but this, this is also our conditioning. And, and yet you don't want to fall into that attachment because then you will start compromising things in your own day-to-day life or uh, leaning on things in your day-to-day life in a way that's going to be harmful. It can, it can be hard to come back. I mean, I, I, I remember after not, after not going on a retreat when, when I got married and we had kids and so on, then after about 10 years, I, I started going back a little, for a week or two at a time. And coming back into the family into, you know, after being on retreat was, was, it was my wife was like, oh, why are you going? To, you'll come back so cranky, you know? Because <laughs> everything, felt, everything felt like an assault. And I, you know, like I could see what was wrong, like everything was wrong. And, um, but gradually it got smoother. Um, so I learned how to do that. Just, uh, what is it? Trying to face the rampant negativity. Could you hold the mic in your mouth? The, the negativity that's around us everywhere, it seems to be, at, well, it is at, at the moment. How do we, we're here and we're trying to find some joy and some relief. And how can we communicate that easily to our families so that they don't reject us or doubt us or whatever? That, I find that a, a real challenge, uh, uh, how to combat negativity, I guess. Negativity about uh, well, is the negativity bias? Our immediate reaction to everything seems to be negative. We can't do. We it's not a can do. It's a can't do, or that can't be, or non. We, no, there's little joy, or it's very. Uh, uh, everything is sort of monotone towards the negative. I would say, or leans towards a negative reaction. Every, every year uh, in, uh, around the Tibetan New Year, uh, Tibet has puts on a uh, concert at Carnegie Hall uh, where all, all these wonderful musicians come and play in a celebration of uh, 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 creative you know, music and creative expression uh, as an um, offering to uh, universal uh, uh, wisdom. Uh, and, and Bob usually comes out at the beginning and introduces the entire program by talking about the, the contribution that, uh, that artists make to uh, uh, making this world, uh, bringing it closer to the Buddha field, to the Buddha verse that it could be. Uh, so I think, uh, I think somehow that's... Uh, 
a good way of combating the negativity is by embracing or embodying the, that, that creative spirit that is uh, all around us, actually. Even if it's not in <coughs> any one individual, uh, it's certainly in the person sitting next to you. So uh, that, you know, we're still trying to put good energy into the world. Hey folks, thanks for listening. To learn more about Sharon and her ongoing teaching schedule, as well as online courses and a free guided meditation, check out her website at SharonSalzberg.com.